All right, we gave college football halfway point. Can't believe that, but we got plenty of top 25 matchups we've got to go over. We've got uh, maybe a dog or two on the card here today that we're going to look at. And, of course, a round of best bets here, and we'll do it with, oh, you know who, Kelly Stewart in the house. Marco D'Angelo here yet. Can't believe it's week eight, guys. Uh, bet on it, the college football edition. Ready to roll, and we're going to start with a couple of top 25 teams getting ready to do battle. Doesn't get any better than a good old Big Ten battle between Illinois and Michigan in this one, uh, Cal. I mean, this has been Illinois. They can't win in this series, but they have covered over the last 10, 7-3 and three against the number over the last 10 meetings. Uh, who do you trust in this matchup? It's It's interesting. Yeah, I think you can make an argument for either side mm. to trust. Uh, last week, Illinois, you know, looking really good over a really bad Purdue team. And then all of a sudden, it was a game. Like, I, I remember just flipping back and forth and being like, what happened, Illinois? Because you know why I use them in the splash college football survivor <laughs> that John Murray and I have going on. So all of a sudden, it got very interesting. And part of me didn't want to use Illinois there, but I knew that was the best spot. But Maybe they got caught looking ahead to Michigan. You know, then you've got Michigan off a bye. They made their quarterback change prior to that Washington game. If you remember, we were on Washington. Now you have a Michigan team who looks to be well-rested, have a better quarterback under center. I think this looks like a dead-on under game, Joe, and I know that's very boring and not what anybody wants to hear. Either side could win it, and I would not be shocked in the slightest to see this one end 20 to 17. Yeah, I, very hard to, to argue with that one with those two teams, uh, Cal. It's uh, Illinois just can't seem to get over the hump uh, against Michigan, but somehow stay within a number. That number ain't all that big uh, in this game here. Uh, neither is the one, uh, Marco, in maybe the primetime game of all primetime games. Maybe a prelude uh, to what could happen uh, maybe in January is number five, Georgia, getting some points against number one, Texas. Boy, what do you do? You go side, you go total. What are you doing this thing? Well, Joe, I'm going with a side. And I'll be honest with you, whenever I first looked at the game, I automatically thought, huh, I'm going to be on Georgia plus the mm. points here. How could I not be? But you know what? You know, I pumped the brakes a little bit and – we like to say or make fun when it happens, the old sharp square dog, I think that's going to be Georgia this week. I think there's going to be a lot of people lining up to take Georgia in the rare role of uh, an underdog in Texas, you know, past history. We've seen them, you know, uh, crap the bed a few times uh, in big games, but this is a different Texas team, in my opinion. Um, yeah, uh, they are number one in the country. They uh, had two signature wins on their card. And when you look at their two signature wins, by name, they were big signature wins. They beat Michigan in the big house, and they beat Oklahoma in uh, the Red River rivalry last week. But we know that both of those teams are down several notches this year, Michigan and Oklahoma. But with that said, this Texas team is built to be an SEC play smash mouth football they can run the football um they run the football well they're averaging 186 yards per game on the ground which sets up the passing game which is throwing for over 300 yards a game you got an offense that's clicking at right around 500 yards per game i think they're going to be able to move the football on Georgia. We know that in years past, Georgia, you know, their signature has been that defense. I don't think this defense is as good as it's been in the past. Uh, we've seen them in some games this year, you know, go back to the Alabama game. You know, yeah, Georgia made mistakes in the beginning of that game, but Alabama moved to football. And the telltale was when Georgia came all the way back and actually had the lead with just over two minutes to go in the game. They couldn't hold the lead. Alabama went right down the field, got the winning touchdown on one big play. Uh, I've got concerns for Georgia, and I know a lot of people are going to look at them and point out the fact that, you know, remember two weeks ago they had the big game against Alabama. They had the revenge game. Last week they had a flat spot after that game. Um, different things you could look at. 
and everybody said the Alabama loss is what cost them their chance to uh, repeat, three-peat, I should say. Let's put it for what it was. Actually, the loss to Alabama started the domino effect, but the real reason that Alabama, that Georgia didn't get to play for the national championship last year was, yes, they lost to Alabama. But because they lost to Alabama, Alabama lost to Texas earlier in the year. And they couldn't put Alabama in and leave Texas out when they beat Alabama. So that left Georgia as the odd man out last year as far as getting into the top four positions for the national playoffs. And, yeah, Texas heard it all last year that they didn't deserve to be there, and Georgia did. Well, you know what? I think Texas is going to show Georgia that the committee got it right and they deserve to be there. I like Texas. I'm going to go ahead, lay the points with them here. They have yet to allow any team over 13 points this year. I'm going to go ahead and ride with them. I like them. They built this team to succeed in the SEC. I think they get it done. This Georgia team's not the Georgia team that we've seen in the past. Go Longhorns. Ooh, going Longhorns in that one there. Should be uh, a good one. A lot of eyes going to be on that game. I do think there's going to be a lot of eyes on another big battle coming up uh, this weekend. And that's going to be, of course, with who else? Alabama. That's right. You've got number nine, Alabama, taking on Tennessee. In Tennessee, two and a half, 55 and a half is what we are seeing here. Another battle of top 25s here. And listen, uh, is it possible that both these offenses are actually getting worse? Uh, because that's what it looks like here. For all of the love that I have given Josh Heupel, and I have been telling you guys that Josh Heupel and when he coaches, whether it had been a Tennessee or UCF, uh, they were bullies. They like to get out and play from in front. Uh, that whole go, go, go offense up tempo usually leads to a lot of points. And don't forget, they finally beat, I believe, it was a 15-game series losing streak. They ended up winning 52-49 to last year in this game against Bama. And uh, yes, Tennessee was a almost a double-digit dog, but guess what? They were up 20-7 to at the break. Uh, so they have an opportunity here to be able to get out in front because that's what they do. The only problem, they haven't scored a damn point in the first half of the last two games. In fact, when you go over the numbers here, when they've played anybody outside of the SEC, they look very much like that classic Tennessee team. The minute they started playing actual teams in the SEC that could play defense that weren't, what, Chattanooga, Kent State, NC State, they've scored 25, 14, and 17. And let's be realistic. They were lucky to win that game last week against Florida. The only thing I can say about this Tennessee team, I got no issues with this defense. I think this is a real defense. I think at home they're going to be pumped up, ready to go here. I don't trust, as crazy as it is, I don't trust either offense all that much right now. Alabama almost lost to uh, South Carolina again after they had lost to Vanderbilt. Tough spot here for Bama, I think. I, I do believe they're going to be happy to get out of Dodge here, go on the road to Tennessee. Don't trust Josh Heupel's offense. I think Bama's defense will show up. I think Tennessee's defense is going to show up. If I'm looking at this game, I'm only looking at an under. I do think it's a coin flip. The one thing I can say for sure is the defenses here are going to give both offenses some issues. So it is an under for me in Alabama and Tennessee. Hopefully Tennessee will score some points in the first half, though, since uh, they've gone scoreless in the last two. All right, week eight, college football. It is here, halfway point. Gianni the Greek, VR, getting pretty interesting with some of these top 25 matchups this week. What are you seeing in the market, my man? A lot of betting action early, Joe, but a lot of manipulation. A little sprinkle here, a little sprinkle there. I'm getting a lot better at narrowing down the legit moves earlier in the week because there's just so much buybacks later. Um, it, it's hard to draw conclusions uh, until you see, is there going to be any kind of resistance? And then you have to draw the conclusion, is it really resistance because it hit a key number? Is it a middle attempt because it hit a key number? Or was that the initial move 
to begin with was zip manipulation to get the best of it. And what I mean by that is we've seen it over and over and over again where a, a line will get dummied up. Let me, let me jump into a total real quickly that I wanted to share. Baylor, Texas Tech opens 57 and a half. I get told to bet a nickel through one of the accounts I have that is an on-screen account that is labels it as a sharp account and the line moves immediately. I bet a nickel, they move it a half a point. I mm. bet another nickel, it's now sitting at 58 and a half. More books copy that 58 and a half. Next thing you know, I get multiple hits to go under 58 and a half, under 58, under 57 mm. and a half, under 57, under 56 and a half, under 56. So we were able to get one, two, three, four, five, six bets, six big limit bets by simply putting up a nickel here and a nickel there. So there is a lot of that going on and uh, you really need to, to pay attention because again, the goal is to get out ahead of the market, but if it, the market comes back and you're not getting any CLV, you know how that's gonna turn out long-term. So you wanna make sure if you are getting out ahead of the market, you know what's happening because you will end up with a ticket in your pocket with mm -hmm. a worse line than you would've got had you waited till Saturday. So be very cautious if you're simply firing off of line movements. So let's talk, uh, VR, about some of these uh, big games here with line movements. I mean, we, we saw UCLA uh, get hit early against Rutgers this week. We saw Indiana get pushed. There's buyback there. So there's a lot of exactly what you're talking about happening right now on Wednesday. Yeah, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go down the line, and we'll go backwards. We'll start, actually, from that Indiana game, which is the last game on your board, game 419, 420, because here's what happened. Indiana gets hit at five and a half. Indiana gets hit at six and six and a half. They weren't very, very big, big bets, and here's why. Because you're not seeing sevens, mm. okay? Instead of going to seven, you're getting big attached from the sharper books. The sharper book does not want to go to seven. They want to make you lay six and a half minus 115, six and a half minus 120. When that's the case, be very cautious because that's the book saying, A, we're opening up ourselves to a middle, which is not good because someone could lay minus five and a half and take seven. We could find ourselves in big trouble. But more importantly, was this a manipulation to get it to seven so then we get hit 5X, 10X more on Nebraska at plus seven rather than five and a half? That's a perfect example of that. Now I'll go, I'll continue going backwards all of Saturday's action that I've been able to confirm to date. Auburn, Auburn's been getting bet since plus seven. You're now looking at about four and a half or five. Bottom line is the groups that I work with all stopped at plus seven. They took plus seven and that was it. Since then, it's been either Sharps piggybacking, public piggybacking, but it's been, it hasn't been the betting syndicates that continue to drive this number down. It's more the piggybackers and the public also on the Auburn side. Move up to Arkansas, plus three against LSU. That's legit. Move up to Air Force, plus seven, key number, but that's legit. TCU, game 381, plus seven, got the six and a half. That's when it got slammed at six and a half. A little money at seven, but they moved very quickly to six and a half. That's when you saw mass limit bets. The move immediately went two and a half points. They went from six and a half to four very quickly on that um, uh, Utah side. So you, you, uh, on the TCU side, excuse me, you saw that they take a touchdown for very little money, but it was the six and a half number that got buried. And we haven't seen any buyback on Utah the other way. Move on to Michigan minus three against Illinois. That one opened about minus one. I was surprised to see one of the sharper college football groups willing to they lay the three after missing the money line or one, one and a half or two, but they did that. Then Northern Illinois absolutely loved this side. Even at minus three, I just don't think it's high enough. Laid one and a half, laid two and a half, laid three. Here's what's best. When there was some resistance taken on Toledo, that's correct. If you look at the line moves at Wager Talk, follow those odd screen, odd screen or even better, uh, uh, odds logic. That's just amazing with that product that they're putting together with Rick. But check out the line move, and here's what you're going to see. Northern Illinois got bet up to three. That's when you saw some resistance on Toledo plus three. Why not? You got minus one and a half. Why wouldn't you take plus three? Or even guys that sat back and saw some value on Toledo plus three that didn't have any action. But when they went back to two and a half, again, more Northern Illinois action. So this is the same group that told me limit bet them at one and a half, limit bet them at two, limit bet them at two and a half, got enough money down. Then when it got to three, of course, they back off. 
They saw two and a half a little later in the week, a date 24 hours later, get us more at two and a half. So Northern Illinois at less than three, they really like that side. I can't tell you the outcome. There's a lot of randomness involved, but I can tell you that one's as sharp as they come. Move up mm -hmm. to Kansas State, another game I absolutely love. They should be a much bigger favorite, but you got to stop at that key number of three. Why? Because it's West Virginia and they're playing at home. That's one of these situations where the book's only going to move so much and we're still able to get that EV, almost like baseball totals. I used to talk about this all the time. You could go back into the late 90s, early 2000s, and it don't matter if it's Pedro Martinez against Greg Maddox. The lowest total they're going to throw out there is seven. That's just what we were used to. So instead of going to six and a half, they just went to seven minus 120, 130, 140. They wouldn't go to six and six and a half. Now we see totals of five, five and a half, like it's nothing, especially during the playoffs. So what I'm saying is we were able to get make so much money during that time because they were forced to stop at a key number. Kind of reminds me of Kansas State, West Virginia. I think Kansas State should be a much bigger favorite. That's just my opinion. But that key number of West Virginia is what's keeping them honest. Move on to Cincinnati. That went through key numbers, so you got to be careful there. Once they go through that three, you got to pay attention, especially when you're getting it with under money. So we went under 53 and a half, under 52, all the way down to under 51 and a half. Finally, Kentucky, Florida. I love when I see this. This is what I love to share. When you have the power to manipulate the market, that's exactly what you should be doing because I got a ticket on Kentucky for one group and the same group has a ticket on Florida at plus money. So they're not like plus 105 on one ticket, plus 111 on the other ticket. Regardless what outcome happens, they're going to earn some money. That's the name of the game. Try to find those advantageous positions more than trying to pick the outcome of the games. Treat it like a market. You'll do some damage. Finally, some primetime games for uh, earlier in the week. Obviously, we know uh, Florida International got slammed against Utah. That's up to that key number of seven. So it's too late if you like the Florida International side. Then on Friday, wanted to share this. Oklahoma State, BYU gets dummied up the plus 10. That's when the Oklahoma State money came in. So if you looked at it right on paper, you'd be like, ah, must be a big move on BYU. They opened seven and a half, got to about 10. No, 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 no. Not much money did it take to move that up to that near 10. When that 10 got there, that's when the money came in. Now, public going to get BYU, so you may be able to get 10 again, uh, but that's the legit side as far as Friday action. That's what I got for college football as of Wednesday. Remember, I'll be on last call with Kelly on Saturday. That's when we really tighten up the parameters for what's a, a, a legit move. And of course, a lot of that late action, those team totals, those first half totals that uh, have done damage year in and year out. So uh, whether you follow or fade, again, I just hope you cash them, don't trash them, do some damage. All right, VR, see you Saturday. Last call as always, my man, as we get ready for what should be uh, an interesting next couple of days, that's for sure, in college football. All right, so let's start off with everyone's favorite. How about a double-digit dog here in week eight of the college football season? And Cal, you going to uh, Memphis and North Texas in this one. Tell me, uh, tell me what we're looking at here. So if you remember, I had bet against Memphis just a few short weeks ago with our good friend Navy. They got the outright win for us, and I hope that North Texas can do the same for us here. Levin, too many points. Last year, they lost 44-34. Excuse me, that 45-42 last year. Two seasons ago, 44-34. Look, this is a really great pass attack that we see from North Texas. And Memphis has been a little less than impressive. Not defensively, just offensively. I know Memphis's defense is very, very solid, but I do think the North Texas offense is going to test them. This is a lot of points for a pair of teams that look pretty similar here on paper. Again, Memphis with the defensive edge, but they're just three and seven against the spread as a conference home favorite since 2020. And in that, there was three outright upsets. So I expect North Texas to keep this one within the number. And of course, you got to look at them for a money line sprinkle, just like last week with Vanderbilt. All right. That's uh that is a sweet number right there. Plus uh, 11 with North Texas taking on Memphis, little double digit dog and Marco. Boy, the deli is open, but oh man, I thought the <laughs> NFL one was disgusting. Uh, I have hives with this team because they screwed me last week and when I faded the public and backed them. You think we're going to get a little different result here with uh, West Virginia? Is that what you're looking at? 
Yeah, Joe, I, I am. And, you know, have you ever seen one of those viral videos on TikTok where somebody's in a fast food uh, shop and they order something and they get the order wrong and somebody just goes batshit crazy and mm -hmm. they throw the food at the, the counter, the server and everything? Well, that's going to be Kelly this week oh, with my, you know, oh. my sandwich. She is going to just throw it right back at us and that and well, what can I what can I say? But uh, <laughs> I am going against Kelly's Kansas State team, and you know, sorry, Kelly, I got to do what we got to do. And the situation here is this is a bad spot for your Wildcats, and let's set it up, Kelly. You know, sorry, you I'm play... over here fixing my hair because I'm that unfazed. I'm just yeah. <laughs> hanging out. Yeah. Going, oh, shocker. <laughs> You want to back Neil Brown, who somehow still has a job. Did you look at the other two top 25 teams that they faced this year? That's right. They got absolutely boat raced. But sorry, Marco, this is your segment. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank, thanks. You know, uh, <laughs> but we got to look at what the situation is. Kansas State, you know, two weeks back, they played a team. Well, I'm just going to nail and aid everybody on the panel. They <laughs> played <laughs> Oklahoma State. Oh, and they great. just beat the shit out of them <laughs> in an ugly game. And at the time, that was a big game because we didn't really know how bad Oklahoma State really was. And if you remember coming into the season, there was a lot of people that had Oklahoma State as one of the favorites to win the Big 12 this year. Well, they boat raced them. Then you go after that big win and you go and play primetime and sun in Colorado in the altitude. That's a big game, not necessarily because Colorado is good. It's a big game because of all the hype that surrounds Colorado. Well, they were pounding Colorado and then they let Colorado come back in through the back door. That was a little small makeup for me for all of the front doors I blew on Saturday. I got to sneak in one of the back doors with Colorado there. Uh, now you're on the road for a second week in a row. You're traveling to play a Saturday night game in Morgantown. Let me tell you, Saturday night in Morgantown, if you've never been there, there's not a lot to do. You're either going to go to a football game or drink or do both of them at <laughs> the one spot. And that's what you'll have in Morgantown on Saturday night. But the other thing is, look what's next for Kansas State. And I don't care if the team they're playing is absolute trash. Kelly cannot deny it. They hate the team they're playing next. They want to run it up because they know what will happen come basketball season. The roles will be reversed. So K-State's looking ahead to Kansas on deck. And, yeah, Kelly pointed out that West Virginia got rolled by a couple uh, top 25 teams. Well, They've played a pretty tough schedule so far. They're three and three. The three losses all came to top 25, not only top 25 teams, undefeated top 25 teams. They played Penn State, Pitt, and Iowa State. I am looking at West Virginia to pull the upset here. I think Kansas State gets caught with their pants down, looking ahead to give it to Kansas next week. I'm going with West Virginia. That's the sandwich game of the week. Don't hate me, Kelly. And just a shameless plug here. If you like the sandwich shop segment, we're doing another video. We release it on Friday mornings over at Wager Talk TV. And the deli's open. I'll give you all the other uh, sandwich spots that I was looking at for the week so you can pick up some other stuff. It's been popular, gaining traction. appreciate you guys tuning in to that show as well. And I know Kelly's just waiting to rip me a new you-know-what. <laughs> no, I'm not ripping anything. I, I just have a serious question. How do you look ahead to a team that's 1-5 in five that you've won 15 straight against? This is not like – this is not some good Kansas team that, like, maybe you can catch them off the heels of Colorado and then they're playing like a – I don't know, even if they were – even if they were four and two, this team is one and five. Their athletic director is going after their burner accounts that were at this point in time and barstool you because it, that is how bad trouble is in paradise that is also known as Lawrence, Kansas. But yeah, sure, Neil Brown. Yeah, you know, he's got Chris Kleiman's number and all. Uh, we'll see. K State by 17. Ooh, <laughs> man. Shots fired. I'm telling you Shots right fired. Now, I know this, I know this <laughs> team and I know when to back them and I know what to bet against them. 
Yeah, Last week, you- they were up double digits. Avery threw a touch or an interception and I threw a high noon at a birthday party because I knew exactly that was the blown <laughs> cover. And that's exactly what happened. And then they ended up winning the game virtually no sweat because that's what happens when you play a defense like Colorado. And when you play a defense like West Virginia, as long as he does not throw an interception, this is going to be a runaway game because if Connor Riley takes his foot off the gas like he did against Colorado, he's going to be looking for a new job. Mm. Yeah. Now, all I can say is this ain't Oklahoma State this week. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, or yeah. Arizona. Or Arizona. Yeah. I mean, I, there are plenty of teams that this team has throttled that are really good. West Virginia, listen, at the start of the season, I was concerned for this game and this spot. But again, not against a 1-5 Kansas team, not against a very marginal at best West Virginia team. Yeah, not for nothing, okay. Mark. You you've can't been be to Morgan out. Town, Kelly. You, I know. I know you've been there. You know what that crowd's going to be like Saturday night. Oh. For what? What? What is there to be excited about? Yeah. A, uh, a, maybe a bowl game. Maybe oh, do they oh. maybe get to go to a bowl game? I mean, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I think oh, they're losing them. That's they, they exciting lost them for West Virginia. What else? Game. Do they, what else do they got? Well, they're, they're going to go to a bowl game or Waffle House. Okay. All right. Oh, wow. <laughs> God damn. Shots fired everywhere here. This is I, unreal. Morgantown. I, I'm just stating wow. what the obvious is. And every night game I've ever been to in Morgantown, K State has won, including being oh. three point dogs versus Geno Smith. So, oh. are you there on Saturday night? Oh. I am not going to be because it's not worth my time to okay. go. Yeah, and I shouldn't even go to the KU game at this point, but I asked for field passes. So I would look like a complete utter jackass if I didn't show up. That uh, looks like us. Uh, well, I got news for you, Marco. I don't, you, you know, you, you had to throw my Oklahoma State Cowboys under the bus and tell us how West Virginia kicked their ass. Well, so did K State. Okay. So there you go. I don't know how that makes your argument any better. A plus B equals C, Marco. Yeah, your exactly. Handicap. That's ridiculous. Unbelievable. All right. Screw West Virginia because they screwed me last week as uh, we faded the uh, the public uh, with Iowa State and Iowa State uh, ended up boat racing them here this week. Our fade the public and I I'm sorry I just don't I don't understand it. How in the hell is USC hopping on the road again, going the furthest east that they have gone yet? This will be the most uh, traveled uh, that they have gone. Coming off of what has to have been one of the most epic meltdowns. Great game, but a game in which was easily in hand, especially after the first half, and then they allowed uh, Penn State back in and ended up losing the game. In the meantime, you've got a Maryland team coming off a terrible loss with maybe just a slight, maybe a little peek ahead here to this USC situation as they turned the ball over four times, uh, which led to 13 points for Northwestern. Hence, that's why they ended up losing that game. I think we're going to get a much more focused Maryland team in this spot. And this is just an awful spot for USC uh, in a role that they are not good. You know, USC is a favorite, is 4-13 and 13 against the number since last year. I'll repeat, 4-13 and 13 against the number since last year. Also, USC, 20, 35, and 2, 36% in games played outside the Pacific Standard time zone. Three and eight, by the way, since the start of 2021. And by the way, I don't that half a point covered by Penn State uh doesn't count. You still lost and you should have won the game. No way do I want to be laying a touchdown or more with USC, although the public is going to look at this and think USC is going to have absolutely no problem covering it. Maryland can't be trusted. And in a lot of spots, I agree, especially when Maryland's a favorite like they were last week. But getting a touchdown at home against a team having to fly cross country again, not what I'm looking at. I think Maryland plus seven. I'll be fading the public in USC this week. I'll be taking the touchdown in what is ultimately not a spot I want to back USC or Lincoln Riley. Not a good situation for the Trojans. All right, it is that time. Little TNA here. Ralph Michaels in the house. College football week eight. Ralph, interesting matchup you got for us here today. Tell us about it. I'm guessing this isn't going to be the ABC primetime game on Saturday, Mm -hmm. but... uh, 
it's fun to watch a game if you can cash a ticket, and I think you will with this game. I am going to look at the Texas State Bobcats visiting the Old Dominion Monarchs traveling down to Norfolk, Virginia. We're going to go ahead and lay 10 points on the road in this Sun Belt game. Now let's take a look. Is it okay to lay 10 points with Texas State against Old Dominion? I have Old Dominion down quite a bit. When you look at their Coastal Carolina game, that was a loss. The Georgia State game was a win, but they were plus turnovers. Their only other win on the season at Bowling Green when they were plus turnovers. It's important if you're going to take a Sun Belt team like Texas State to know you have a winning type quarterback with a coach who knows how to extend the lead. So let's take a look at Texas State. They're in the second season with G.J. Kinney as their head coach. They've made positive moves this year. Their quarterback, yeah, they happened to go out and get a guy named Jordan McLeod who was, oh yeah, by the way, the Sun Belt Player of the Year last year with James Madison. He has a 19-5 ratio this season. The Monarchs, only 3-10. and 10. That is 23.1% against the spread their last 13 home games. As I mentioned, Old Dominion is off a win against Georgia State where they were plus a turnover in that game. But teams that are a conference home dog of 10 or more off a conference win are only 48 and 85, 34.1% against the spread. But this truly is a matchup game. We look at Texas State's offense, number 12 in yards per game this year in the country, Old Dominion's defense, number 108. We look at explosive plays, those plays 20 yards or longer. Texas State's offense, number 41. Old Dominion defense, number 114. Old Dominion, without their starting quarterback, Grant Wilson, he was last year's starter and he was a team captain. That makes, the, that makes it a much more difficult quarterback to replace. They go to Colton Joseph, who's a mobile quarterback. Joseph has rushed for 232 yards in his last three starts, 6.6 yards per carry, but he's only completing 55% and only 5.7 yards per attempt. When you look at Texas State with Kenny, are they able to get margin? Well, their last two games, they were favored by 13 and a half and 14 and a half. Not only did they cover both, they covered by a combined 25 points against the spread. And with Kinney here, the last season plus, they've been an away favorite of six or more twice. Not only are they 2-0 and ATS, they've covered those by 16 points in those two games. So I have a team with a great offense, a decent defense against a poor offensive team, Texas State minus the points, an actual client release for me this weekend, and my TNA best bet. Oh, Ralph, love it. Should be a hell of a game there, even though it's not a primetime affair. Uh, it still prints the same money, Ralph, and that's what it is all about, my friend. As always, we appreciate it. We'll see you on the NFL edition of Ben On It for another TNA game you're going to break down for us. But first, it's time. For some best bets. All right, Kelly, kick us off here. Best bet time. And uh, boy, oh boy, it seems like we've, I feel like we've bet this team a few times over the first seven weeks of this season, especially in a dog roll. What are you thinking here about Michigan State this week? Yeah, I just can't quit Jonathan Smith as an mm. underdog. What do you want from me? This defense is absolutely solid. I would have bet him last week if I could have, but they were on a bye. And that's kind of why I'm looking at him in this spot here. This is an Iowa team. Hey, I want to give them all the credit in the world. Kirk Ferentz fires his kid, and all of a sudden they just start flying over the total. The Iowa days of going dead on unders and punting more than anybody else. Those days are now gone. Congratulations to them. But I think we're going to see a ton of punts in this one, and that is because this is one of the best defenses in the Big Ten, and no one cares at all to talk about them. I don't understand where the lack of respect comes for Sparty. This team has been absolutely solid against the run, against the pass, and uh, I don't see how you could want to lay the number with the Hawkeyes here. Again, Sparty faced, you know, a really tough 
schedule, if you will. Ohio State, Oregon, back-to-back weeks, and they only scored 17 points. But I expect them to be able to move the ball better here against an Iowa defense. I think this looks like it could be a higher-scoring affair than most people project. I'm hoping Michigan State can get it done outright for us, but I'm taking the plus six and a half. Ooh, taking the plus six and a half, uh, going right back at it with Michigan State in this one. And Marco, how about you as you thoroughly pissed everybody off taking shots here uh, in your last segment? Marco so, said he was going to retire. Now he's just going to go out with a bang. He's uh, like, I'm just going to retire <laughs> and give everybody the Tom Brady double bird on my way out. Exactly what he's looking forward to. So go ahead and do it. Uh, you, you alienated both of us last segment. Who are you going to alienate for your best bet? <laughs> okay, no problem. First of all, guys, don't panic. I'm not retiring anytime soon. Okay, That's but, he's been on the sales uh, call. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I love you guys. If you guys want Marco to re- retire, please drop it in the, the perspective chat. Please retire, Marco. We're sick of your shitty sandwiches. Yes. When you make us eat things like West Virginia that are absolute hot garbage. Correct. <laughs> All right. You, both of you can just get off my goddamn lawn right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've had enough of both of you. All right. Oh, hey, if any of you guys still do like me, let me tell you about the special we got at Wager <laughs> Uh, it's the same special as last week. Uh, we are absolutely uh, killing it in 2024, having a good start to the football season. And you can pick up the rest of 2024 for $595. That comes out to $7.50 a day, less than $7.50 a day. Uh, hockey just got started. We released uh, last night our first two hockey plays of the season, went 2-0 and there. NBA is about to start last four years. Number one handicapper at Wager Talk up 198 units uh, in the uh, NBA. So check that out. Not going anywhere anytime soon. Much to Kelly and Joe's dismay. All right, let's get to the uh, best bet for this week. And Joe, I don't know what we're going to do because – I look forward to every week of the college football season getting the updates. Cam Rising. He might play this week. No, he might not. He's going to No, he's not. We don't have to worry about that anymore because Cam Rising, unfortunately, was announced on Monday. He is done for the season. They're pulling the plug. Now, last week, I went against Utah. We had a play going against them last week, and the whole reason I did that First thing I said in my analysis was, I like this play even better with Cam Rising starting the game. And he did. And I said, he's going to be rusty. Threw three interceptions in that game. Threw for just over 200 yards. He was a pathetic uh, 16 of 37 in that game. And he never should have played. And we had an easy win last week with Arizona State as uh, an underdog in that game, like it and, or excuse me, they, uh, yeah, they were five and a half point underdog, went out right. Now the season's done for him, but I like Utah. Why would I want to do that? Well, look at it this way. Now the backup quarterback doesn't have to go through every week listening to, hey, is Cam starting? Am I starting? They know who's starting. He's going to get all the reps in practice. Now you don't have to devise two game plans. You can devise one game plan that suits the strengths of your quarterback, uh, Isaac Wilson. I like Utah. They still have one of the better defenses in the country. And I think they're going to slow down this TCU uh, offense. And it doesn't matter even if they don't slow it down because the TCU defense hasn't been able to stop anybody this year. I'm looking for Utah to get the job done in this spot. And How many times do we say it, you know, the injured player theory? Now that the season is officially over for Cam Risen, I think you treat this week's game as that, you know, injured player. This is basically the first game that you know you're without him for the rest of the year. I think you're going to get a focused effort from Utah. And remember, the backup played three, started three games already. He went two and one. This is a team that sitting at four and two, you would think, that all of their uh, hopes for the playoffs are done? Not really, because they still have to play two of the 
three teams that are at the top of the Big 12. They can work their way back into uh, the play of the championship game for the Big 12, and we know the Big 12 champion gets an automatic berth into the playoffs. So their season goals are not done yet. The next loss would do that. And by the way, when they do play those two teams later in the season um, that are at top, they play them both at home, and that's BYU and Iowa State. I'm going to go with Utah to roll this week. I don't like this TCU team at all. Lay the points with Utah. Let's take a look here, if we could, at another Big Ten game. Uh, And this time, I'm going to be looking at the upstart and cash cow this year. How about the Indiana Hoosiers laying less than a touchdown going up against Matt Rule and Nebraska? And listen, both of these schools and these teams this year have been just flat out good. And they've been cash cows to a certain extent, certainly against the number if you have been backing them. But both of these teams are coming off a buy, and I believe there is significant advantages for this Indiana team coming off the buy, having this game at home. Uh, and I think the quarterback position is one of the top reasons why I like Indiana. Listen, Nebraska's freshman quarterback, Dylan Raiola, was just awful last week against uh, his last game against Rutgers. 13 to 28, 134 yards, and he threw a pick, and that was at home, by the way. Uh, Why? Because they got into his face. Uh, Keeping in mind, as as much as I love the ceiling for this kid at Nebraska or Matt Rule, he's still a freshman. This is also just his second true road start as a freshman and now he's going into an Indiana team that forget about everything you've known about Indiana football under Tom Allen over the last you know five six years this is a totally different unit that returns a whole bunch of starters brought a whole lot of guys over from JMU and maybe the most important piece that they brought with them was Curtis Rock, the quarterback, who feels like he's been playing in college football now since 1986. And he is certainly proving that he has got the experience here. He's completing over 70% of his passes here. Uh, The Indiana Hoosiers are first in passing rate success. Uh, They are having no problems putting up points. They also have a great advantage in special teams, The defense of Nebraska has been very, very good, but they also have not faced an offense like the one they're going to see here in Indiana. Very hard to look at a 5-1 and team at Nebraska and be like, oh, my goodness, i I got to take the points. Uh, I've got to take Nebraska on the road getting, uh, getting under a touchdown or just about a touchdown. Yeah, I'm not because I believe this team is clearly going to show it is better than Nebraska. It's got a better offense, it's better special teams, and the defense is plenty good enough at home to be able to cause some aggravation for this true freshman, as good as he can be, and probably will be in college, in his college career. I don't think this is going to be one of his better games. I believe Indiana wins this. I think they win it easily, and I've got no problem laying the six and a half, backing the undefeated, I can't believe I'm saying this, the undefeated Indiana Hoosiers, what a difference a coach makes in college football. And there you got it. Best bets in the house here. Week 8 of the college football season is almost here. Don't forget, smash that like button if you could. Give us the thumbs up. Drop any questions, comments you have about the games in the comments section. We'll be checking them right up until kickoff. So any information we can get to you guys, we certainly will. On behalf of Kelly... Marco, and of course, uh, Ralph Michaels in VR. Guys, we appreciate the time as always. Cash those tickets. Make sure you come back and join us again. Another edition, week nine of the College Football Kickoff Show. We'll be here next week. Good luck. We'll see you again soon.